Today I'm going to go to the outer limits, okay? We're going to talk about the sovereignty of God, and I know we could talk about this for days and weeks, and it's, it is the uh, uh, battles erupt when you talk about the sovereignty of God. There's all kinds of different positions. We're just going to kind of skirt the outskirts today, and again, this is going to be a building block for a future message, so I just wanted to uh, open up this doctrine a little bit. Let's just see some, a few things that the Word of the Lord has to say, the Word of God has to say, Amen. The sovereignty of God. This is the big question and causes theological debates and causes a lot of turmoil in our own lives trying to figure this stuff out as we go, right? Amen? I don't have my Kindle today, so I can't read from it, so I hope I'm not in your way over here. Sovereignty. This is the question. The definition of the sovereignty is the full right and power of, of a governing body over itself without any interference from outside sources or bodies. It is the ultimate or supreme authority. In the United States, we are a sovereign nation, and we are a sovereign nation based upon our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. That is the ultimate authority that runs our country. Amen? And so, the Word of God is the ultimate authority that runs our lives through the Holy Ghost. Amen? So now, when it comes to theology, there's really three major streams that argue over this, right? We have theory number one. Here's theory number one. And this is called Arminianism. And this theory says that God sets things in motion and currently is hands-off and very non-interfering. In other words, Father God and Jesus came and made the world and set things in motion and now they just kind of let things go. Right? Theory number two says the opposite. God has preordained everything that is going to happen. That is called Calvinism. Calvinism is, uh, is uh, uh, basically, well, you know, it was God's will. So no matter what happens, you know, we're just a ship on the sea of God's will and there's nothing you can do about it. It's very fatalistic, right? Theory number three, God steers history in his favor at the same time allowing things as to protect mankind's free will. This is called shared sovereignty. My personal opinion, I don't agree with number one or two. I kind of lean towards theory number three, and I'm going to show you why from the scriptures. Amen. Again, this is going to be a, this teaching is going to be a situation where don't take my word for it. Be like the Bereans and search the scriptures for yourselves. Amen. I do not want to impose my view of this on anyone. I just want to open it up for you, for you guys to discover for yourself and see if we come to our agreement or what you come up with. Amen? Let's roll. The basis of God's sovereignty, there is absolutely nothing that happens in the universe that is outside of God's influence and authority. As King of King and Lord of Lords, God has no limitations. Consider just a few of the claims the Bible makes about God. Number one, the Bible claims that God is omnipotent. What does that mean? It means God is above all things, before all things. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is immortal and He is present everywhere so that everyone can know Him. You could look at something like Revelations 21.6 or John the first chapter is very clear on this issue, right? Number two, He's all-powerful. God created all things and hold, holds all things together, both in heaven and on earth, both visible and invisible. That's from Colossians 1 and 16. He also says that God holds all things together by the power of his word. And, you know, you could look at this and science have proved it, proved it from a subatomic molecular level. The fact that inside the nucleus of every atom are two negative charges, which according to scientific theory should repel one another and everything in the universe should absolutely destroy itself. But that's not the case, and they have no answer as to why. And I believe this is God proving that He holds all things together by the power of His Word. Amen? Omniscience. God knows all things past, present, and future. There is no limit to his knowledge, for God knows everything completely before it ever happens. Romans 11.33 is clear on this. Now I'm going to explain it to you 
Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of a look at time here, how it works from the physical property of time and how that ties in uh, powerfully with the Word of God. Amen? So let's say you just uh, left your body and you passed on and you're going up to the pearly gates. So you're walking up to the pearly gates right now. Let's pretend, right? We don't want that to happen yet, right, Mama? When, when the right time comes. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not pushing anything, right? So let's just say, here we go. There is a, a banner that hangs over the pearly gates and it says, whomsoever will, right? It's an invitation, right? To go through this gate, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is God's rules on his, on his invitation. So you see, we see this from our perspective even right here. We know the pearly gates are waiting for us, and we know that the banner has already been given, whomsoever will, right? So whomsoever will is a statement of choice, it is not an absolute statement. It is a statement of choice that puts the imperative on us that we must be the choosers, right? Now, here's something interesting that happens. Now, let's say you passed on and you accepted Christ and you've been welcomed through the pearly gates. Let's flip. Now you're looking, you've come through the gates like this and you turn around and look and it says, called and chosen from the foundation of the world. Everyone see the implications of that? It's astonishing implications, right? So here's a scripture that we were all called and chosen from the foundation of the world that is a message to believers. At the same time, you have a choice. When you accept the choice, you receive your place that Christ has purchased for you at the cross, that you are called and chosen from the foundation of the world. So here I am, whomsoever will, I believe, Lord. I go through the gate, and what's the backside say? I am called and chosen from the foundation of the world. And that's a statement of absolute fact. So before you have a choice, afterwards is a statement of fact that is unchangeable. Amen? When the blood has purchased you, you are purchased. Hallelujah. Everyone see the, the implications of that? So, you know, as I've taught for several years now here, past couple years since I've been here, oh, what's going on over there, but let's keep rolling here. <laughs> <laughs> The Bible is a spiritual book, okay? It takes the mind of this Holy Spirit in order to interpret it, that scripture. Paul says, He who does not have the mind of the Spirit cannot understand the things of the Spirit because these things are spiritually discerned. Amen? And so when you have the Holy Spirit, you begin to be able to what's called divide the Word of God. As Peter and Paul have talked about learning to rightly divide the Word. Rightly divide the Word means you're able to understand the word, you're able to understand its spiritual implications, and you're able to apply it to your life. So oftentimes when Christians get confused is they don't develop this ability to divide the word and they don't understand things of the spirit. Things of the spirit happen from the eternal realm. Things of the carnal happen in the natural realm. But for us, the two are together. And we must learn to divide these two. Amen? We must learn to understand what scripture is saying what for what and what scripture Scriptures, what for what, right? And we've talked about the indicatives, right? The indicatives are things in Scripture that God has done, right? Like, you have been seated in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus when you believed. That's something that God has done when you believed. He did the rest. You can't earn it. You can't make it happen, can you? Now, on the flip side, there are also what's called imperatives. Those are commands in the New Testament that we must walk out. Walk in the Spirit. Is not, that's an imperative. You, as a believer, must choose to daily walk in the Spirit. Paul says you must mortify the flesh. That means you must, from your inward union in God, put to death the carnal nature's rule over your life and decide, you know what, body? You're not going to rule over me. The Holy Spirit is going to help me make my choices, right? Those, that's an imperative that we must walk out that's not automatic. We must understand how to divide those things. Things. Amen? Now, the basis of God's sovereignty, He is omnipresent. 
That means God's presence and influence is everywhere. Psalm 139.7 says, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? There is no place in your life that you can ever be outside the presence of God. It's an impossibility. Amen? Amen. And uh, in Romans here, I know it didn't show up too well, but it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And we've talked about this before. If you behold the creation, I can look at that tree right now, and according to the scripture in Romans chapter 1, you logically must, God gives you a choice to use logic and reason that he gave you to say, you know what, I don't believe that that tree evolved from nothing that's impossible that is a fantastic and complex biological machine that must have been created. So God's saying, people argue, oh, but we never heard about God before. God puts the whole humanity on call right here. You can observe the creation and know that there is a God. And he expects you to come to that conclusion because the evidence is overwhelming. Amen? So his presence and his influence are everywhere. Number five, God can do all things and accomplish all things. Nothing is too difficult for him. Whatever he wants to do in the universe, he does, for nothing is impossible with him. He has in mind specific calls, gifts, and destinies for each one of our lives. Romans 11.29 says this, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That means that your life is patterned and destined by God for a specific purpose. Amen? That means that each one of us has a destiny. Right? You may be an evangelist. You may be just. You may be a, a servant. You may be an encourager. You may be a prophet. You may be one. Any one of it. But you have a specific purpose. And the tragedy is. Here's the tragedy. From my experience and my observation over almost 20 years in ministry now, very few Christians actually identify and grow in and walk out their gifts. Most Christians just sit in a pew every Sunday and they go to Bible study and they never grow past it. You're not just meant to sit in a pew and just go to the Bible study. You're meant to grow in the Lord. You're meant to identify and grow in your gifting. Amen? Amen. And we talked about this on Wednesday night, and I'll, I'll embarrass Robin again because it's a good example. When I met Robin, I could, my wife and I could discern Robin has the gift of compassion. She's very empathetic and she's very compassionate. And helping her identify and develop that gift comes in handy because when someone has a struggle and they need someone gentle to talk to or just uh, or someone to be with them, she's gifted for that. That's her calling. That's her purpose in the church. She will cry with you and because there's times when we need that. Amen? And so each one of us has that specific design and purpose. I, man, I stopped my life dead till I figured it out. Well, I kind of had an inkling, but I ran from God for a certain period of my life. But, you know, my, my place in the body, you know, when I came, became comfortable with I'm a teacher, pastor, everything started to come together for my life. When I accepted who I was meant to be, and it was obvious, I started walking in it, and my life just came together. A lot of Christians don't realize what they're calling and gifting's in, and they're bouncing around to and fro never really walking in the fullness of what God has for you. Amen? Jeremiah 32, 17, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Amen? God is in control. And some people get mad at me for saying this, but I'm going to come to a logical conclusion in this. God is sovereign over all things and rules over all things. He has power and authority over nature, earthly kings, history, angels, and demons. Even Satan himself has to ask God's permission before he can act. That's in Psalm 103.9. I'm going to show you something dazzling out of 2 Chronicles 18. There's a story here. And the prophet Micah says, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting 
sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing at his right and his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, king of Israel, to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said, How? And he said, I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And then the Lord said, you are to entice him and prevail also. Go and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of your prophets. For the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you to Ahab and his prophets. The Lord used a satanic spirit to accomplish his will. Put that in your theological pipe and smoke it. <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? But it's the word of the Lord from the prophet of God back in that day. Amen? God used a satanic spirit to accomplish the fall of Ahab. And literally in the natural, they said, go and fight the battle, Ahab, his prophets of, of uh, his, what Baal prophets that he was following. Baal said he'll give you victory, and he went and he got whacked in the battle. Powerful stuff. God can do anything. We have to be very careful in Christendom about these pot shot sayings I see all the time that have no true theological basis in the word of the Lord from the full counsel of God. You know, I see this going around a lot with the latest narrative, uh, you know, that's going around that God's a lover bear and we're all in a campfire to sing, Kumbaya, my Lord, nothing bad ever has to happen to us. Right? And, they, and I've seen this thing going around. Jesus is always pleased with you no matter what. And then I open Revelations chapter 2. And I see Ephesus, Pergamum, and Thyatira. And Jesus, the head of the church, confronts them and says, This I have against you. Don doesn't sound like Jesus was too pleased with the churches. Matter of fact, to Thyatira, he says, Because you did not get rid of that false prophetess, I will cause pestilence to come against you, and I will kill her offspring, not her literal children, the people who follow her false doctrine in the church, and you shall lay down in a bed of sickness. That's from Jesus. Those are not my words. That's not my theology. That's the word of the Lord. Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead because they lied to the Holy Ghost. Not my made-up story. It's the word of the Lord. So we have to take into consideration these things. Now, I understand what they're trying to say that Jesus is always pleased with you because sometimes we beat ourselves up and we need confidence that God loves us and He's not going to kick us to the side because we screw up one time. We don't want to go down the other road of legalism, right? But at the same time, we must incorporate the full counsel of God to all these things that, that are being said. I test all of them. I had one this morning come, come on, on Facebook, and it drives me nuts as a teacher of the Word, right? It's these bizarre, these bizarre uh, inter Bible interpretations that come out. It was the TBT. I have no idea. It's some brand new translation. It says in Ephesians 2.10, you are God's poetry made for his beauty. <laughs> when you look in the original Greek manuscript, it says, You are his workmanship created in good works in Christ that he has prepared beforehand for you to do. The word workmanship is not poetry. It means a design and pattern that he has for your life. So they fluff up through their narrative, this lovey-dovey narrative that, oh, you're just God's work of art and you're God's special snowflake. That's not what God is saying there. Now, are, are we special to God? Yes. Is there times when we need to cuddle with the Lord? Absolutely. Is there time when we need to receive an abundance of love? You betcha, because God is love. But there are also times when we need a spanking. That's just the way it is. I get them. None of us are immune for them, right? 
We have to align all these things with the Word of God. Amen? The age-old question, does God control everything? The answer is no, but He sure does control a lot. Right? Does God cause a murderer to go in and uh, 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 a psycho killer like um, Richard Ramirez back in the 70s? Did God? No, God did not cause that. Fallen man caused that. The enemy Satan caused that. It was not God's will, right? But now here's the question. Since God is omnipotent, omnipresent, all-powerful, all-controlling, knows everything from the end of the beginning, he knew what Richard Ramirez was going to do. He, he knew the people that he was going to kill, and God allowed it. So here's where people get in a conundrum. If God is so loving, why would he allow that? Here we go. And I, I give you, I answer that with a question. If God interfered with every single thing, would, be, be, would we be free creatures? No. If God stopped every bad thing from happening, he'd be worse than the devil. Because he would be completely controlling, you would have no free will, love would not exist, and you would be nothing but robots. In order for there to be free will, in order for us to experience things, God has to allow things to happen. God made himself vulnerable by allowing those things. He's the one that paid the price for our stupidity. He died on the cross. He suffered. Right? So he paid for that. Amen? Amen. That's the only way we can accept Christ is our free will. Exactly. I, I liken it to a marriage. Okay? If someone f forced some bride to come down the aisle with, with me and I had no natural love for her, I was forced to marry her because it was somebody's will stronger than mine, is that love? No. It's not love. What defines my marriage is, was my willing choice of my wife and I, our free will choice, to choose each other over three million other choices we had in the world of the opposite sex. Our marriage can literally be defined by the choice that we made for one another. That's what defines it. And it's the same with the Lord. So a lot of these things have to happen because without it, we'd be robots. And without bad things happening, you would never grow. Just the way it is. We've talked about that before. Amen? To say God is in total control of everything would mean he's responsible for evil and we would not have free will. However, since God is omnipresent, omniscient, and all-powerful, nothing can happen without him knowing. So in this, he allows things to happen to a certain extent. And that's it. There's an extent. God knows everything that will ever happen, yet at the same time experience it moment by moment with us. He works all things for our good, as Paul says in Romans. Let's take a look. Now, now let's get a view of time because real quickly, to understand this, we have to see that we are in time, right? God exists where? In eternity, outside of time. We are in what's called the space-time dimensions. We live in four dimensions, right? Space-time. That's what we live in. So in space-time, here's a good way to look at it. You're going down a long hallway, right? And there's walls around it, which is the extent of the universe. Each color is a different nanosecond in time. As you move forward is the future. Behind you is the past. And the present is literally scientifically called a nanosecond, or what the Bible calls the twinkling of an eye. So the words that I just said to you are now in the past. I'm about to say something that's going to come to a future, but we are in a construct right now, moving through time, whether you realize it or not. We are moving through the time-space domain in time right now. Right now, the earth is spinning at what? What is it? 5,000 miles per hour or something it spins at? And then it travels at 25,000 miles per hour through space. And our galaxy is traveling right now at a million miles per hour and you don't even realize it. Right now where you sit, one second ago, you were about 100,000 miles away in space. And right now, I just traveled another 100,000 miles. You don't even realize it. We're moving at tremendous speeds. Our universe is just absolutely an amazing construct that we live in, but it is a lower dimensionality compared with the eternal realm. In fact, science has discovered and proved it through mathematics there's at least 10, possibly 11 dimensions that you cannot perceive. 
that exists right now where we sit. So I literally believe the eternal realm is right here. We just can't see it because it's at a different speed. Amazing stuff. So here we have, sorry it didn't come out as bright, but we have a horse traveling down the time domain, right? Here comes the horse. Each, each line is a, is a nanosecond in time, right? Now here's God's perspective. God's out here watching... God's out here watching the horse. God can see where the horse came from a few seconds ago. God can see where the horse is right now and experience it in the present. And God also sees where the horse is going in the future. And he proves it through the Bible. The Bible is an integrated message system. What does that mean? It means that inside of this is a story with hidden inside of a story from the beginning to the end. This Bible is not man-made written, though it has, let's see, over, over 44 authors, right, that they know of, that they're sure of, but it tells the same story. Inside of this book, from Genesis to Revelation, is the revelation of the unfolding story of God's love for mankind and the revelation of Jesus Christ. And God authenticates this book because of prophecy, because he declares the end from the beginning. Throughout the entire book, the Old Testament is filled with prophetic imagery, hidden message codes, and all these things that prove this is a supernatural book. There are some 366-something prophecies, specifically in the Old Covenant, about Jesus Christ. He was born in Bethlehem. He was born of a virgin. He would be Emmanuel, or God with us. He would die on a cross and be pierced. His garments would be, they would cast lots for his garment. The whole story is laid out in the prophetic books, hidden in plain sight, right? God wrote those things thousands of years off and ahead of time when they actually happen. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3, when he curses the snake the and he curses the woman, Jesus is right in that story. The seed of the woman, right? The seed of the woman. The man is the seed bearer in the rest of the Bible, except that one instance. Why? Because that's the Messiah. And he will bruise the serpent's head, and the serpent will strike his heel. So the Messiah will be injured by the serpent, but the head will be crushed. It represents his authority. That was a prophetic proclamation right in the midst of the curse. See, God's authenticating that he's outside of time, and this book is outside of time. Amen? Think about for a second if you actually believed with all of your heart that every word you read in here is from God himself. How would that change your life? Think about it. We, sometimes we read it like hoping that it's true, but what if we really grabbed onto it and said, this is the real deal. This is the Word of God. This is from God Himself, written through the Holy Ghost through men. Because God doesn't do anything without using a man. Always uses a man. In the old days, He had the prophets, He had the judges, He had the kings. Now, God uses His church. We are God's primary method of communicating with the world. Amen? Each one of us. Here's another way to look at it. You and I see a parade. One section at a time goes by us in time, right? Now here's us over here, right? God's vantage point, he sees all the whole parade from the beginning to the end. And so here's us in the year 2017, September, what's it, 3rd, 4th, 3rd, right? God sees, oh, November 7th, 2019, you're going to have a rough day because this is coming into your life. And God sees all that, right? Or he could say, you're going you're gonna to hit the lotto this day. In 2024, Robin's going to love life that day, right? But God sees your whole life from the beginning to the end. And yet, at the same time, he lives with you moment by moment, experiencing it as you do. Isn't that amazing? And because God's so powerful, he lives with each one of us individually the same way. He knows every single thing about you, every thought, every hair on your head is numbered. Amen? God is sovereign. 
Let's take a, a quick case study. I'm going to prove to you from Isaiah, the 45th chapter, that God works in mysterious ways and His sovereignty goes beyond what we can think or imagine. Let's take a look-see. Ready? One of the biggest proofs of God's sovereignty and power is His ability to declare, declare things before they happen. Prophetic proclamations prove He is eternal and all-powerful. Let's take a look at the prophet Isaiah in the 45th chapter. What was uh, Isaiah receives this word from the Lord about this great king named Cyrus that's going to come and deliver Israel and be a great conqueror. So he says, Gather yourselves and come. Draw near together, you fugitives of the nations. They have no knowledge, who carry about their wooden idols and pray to a God who cannot save. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from old? Who has long declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. See, he is both a judge and he is both a Savior. He holds both things in each hand, doesn't he? So we'll backtrack, we'll go to verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to Cyrus his anointed. Now Cyrus was a pagan king, did not accept God. Yet he was, uh, there was an anointing on his life. Isn't that amazing? Whom I have taken by the right hand, God sovereignly elected Cyrus to be the king, set him up as king over Persia, right? Because God had to sway history. He had to move on behalf of Israel because they were in great bondage and apostasy. So God raised up this wicked king to subdue the nations before him and loose the loins of the kings and to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. So Cyrus is called God's anointed. He was designed and qualified for his great service by surely by the counsel or the sovereignty of God. The gates of Babylon, which led to the river, were left open the night that Cyrus marched his army into the empty channel. The Lord went before him, giving entrance to the cities he besieged. He gave him also treasures which had been hidden in secret places. And the true God was to Cyrus an unknown God, yet God foreknew him, and he called him by his name. The exact the fulfillment of this must have shown Cyrus that Jehovah was the only true God and that it was for the sake of Israel that he was prospered. In all the changes of states and kingdoms, God works out the good of his church. Adolf Hitler got allowed to go into power. He allowed World War II to happen. Out of World War II came the rebirth of Israel. If World War II didn't happen, Israel would not have been rebirthed. Amazing how he works. Out of all that destruction, and Cyrus was brutal. He was a terror. He wiped whole people groups out. Yet it was God who set the whole thing up. It's, it's, it's hard to fathom. Because we see the lovey-dovey Jesus all the time. But God is a righteous judge, right? and a savior. So he can use the wicked to their own destruction as much as he can use the righteous to save people to accomplish his will. So we have to be very careful when we say we know God would never do this or never do that or we know that God blah 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 blah. You hear this all the time by these 21st century preachers who are led by emotions over the word of God. Amen. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I, I have given you the title of honor, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. That means empowered him. That men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Listen to this carefully, church. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity, I, the Lord, do all these things. That's hard to take in. Get your theological pipe out and put that one in there. That's another tough one to take. Sometimes, sometimes, right? Sometimes, calamities can be of God. But he allows them to happen for a purpose. 
that's hard to take because we have this image of this kumbaya singing all the time. And that is true as well, but it is also true that God works things to his own plans. Amen? Kim Jong-un right now, the North Korean guy. God allowed him to be in power right now. You don't think for a second that if God was through with that man that he would not be wiped out from the face of the earth? You think the United States has much anything to do with it? No, you'd know. Do you think sometimes that when you're voting, you're actually voting? And sometimes God has already decided who a president is going to be? You think you're choosing? You may not be. And Trump may not be who you think he is. You don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. Only God does. Only God does. That's why I distance myself from politics. I have very little to do with it. Because I have a king. I don't have a president. My natural self, I will yield to my governing authorities, as it says in Romans, the 13th chapter. I will pray for whoever's in there, whether it's Obama, Shomama, Yomama. It don't matter. As the Bible says. But none of those people ultimately matter. I have a king. I'm a monarchist. Amen? Democracy doesn't work in the kingdom of God. It's not the way it is. Sorry to say. It's not. It works okay in the world to an extent. But the word of God is not a democracy. It's an election. Church, you have an election. You're not voted in by anybody. I don't sit there and take a vote that God would give Larry the gift of prophecy. We could vote that all day. Guess what? He's already elected and designed for a specific purpose by the king and the head of the church. Amen? Amen? And God's word never returns void. In one of the most amazing prophecies of the Bible, here's the Gipper. Isaiah predicts Cyrus' decree to free the Jews. The astonishing thing about what I just read you is that it happened 150 years before it happened. That was 150 years. People are like, Cyrus, what is this guy talking about? Isaiah took some heat for some of this stuff too. Y'all are a weird dude. And it happened exactly as God said. Even that when he took the city, the gate was left open and he walked right in, just as the word of God said it would. Why? Because God is outside time. He sees the whole thing, every detail, and he ordained it to be that way. The whole thing was because Cyrus would give benevolence to the Jews. The whole thing was so that God would protect his will on the earth so that the Messiah could come. Because if the Jews were destroyed, the Messiah would not be able to come. And the devil knew that. The whole time what was coming against Israel was the devil. Because he knew the Messiah was coming through the line of David. And he was trying to kill that from the beginning. Powerful stuff. Just a few, we're going to close with a few scriptural examples. Jeremiah 29.11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you. Say that over yourself. Right? For I know the plans I have for you. He has plans for you. And what are those plans? to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Every single person born into this world that is speaking to. Not only Israel. Does everyone get to participate in this? Because here's where your choice comes in. You could reject or accept it. It's a free gift. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in some circumstances. Get miserable in others. No. Give thanks in all circumstances. But wait a minute. Doesn't God say that we're supposed to be healthy and wealthy all the time? No. He says there's all kinds of circumstances you're going to face. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is just part of it. It's just one snapshot. What is that saying there? It says that his will is that you become an overcomer in him and that you can face any circumstance in your life and not come apart. 
Hebrews 13 says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We are equipped. You have everything you need to walk out God's will for your life. You don't have to go to the latest Holy Spirit prophet mantle anointing service. You have it already. That stuff is just looking for your money. Those people are looking for your attention. You have it already. You are equipped. You don't need Benny Hinn to bless you. You have been blessed by the Holy Spirit that lives in you. Amen? Amen. Man, I wish they would start telling people who they really are and what they have. But they want to build up their own ministry empires is what they want. You know how you can test these clowns? Follow the money trail. When they had the... It's the Isaiah 58 11 day. If you give $58.11 every month, you'll get the Isaiah 58 11 blessing. That is nothing but manipulation, and those men are going to have to answer for that nonsense. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with what? Some of your heart? And lean a lot on your understanding, your philosophy. No, lean not on your limited understanding that we have in the natural, but in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. You've got to submit that stuff in your mind. You've got to submit that stuff in your heart and say, Lord, I don't know why, but I'm going to trust. It will happen in time. Amen. That's his promise. Proverbs 16 says the Lord works out everything. Say everything. Everything. Wow, everything to its proper end. Even the wicked for the day of disaster. See, because they had a choice. And, God, and, and grace only goes so far. Grace is super abundant. I preach it all day. You know that. But there is a limit to it. You only have so much time to accept, to enter into the covenant, do it. Ain't, ain't that the truth? Hebrews 10 and 36 says you need to what? So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. That mean, that's a lifelong thing. That's not a one-time deal. Because you overcame someone cussing you out at the store and you had some patience that day. That's just the start. You have to persevere your entire life. You have to become an overcomer, right? When you're called to do the will of God and you persevere all the things that come with it, the reward is coming. You just got to rest. Amen? Rest in that. Ephesians 5.15, Be very careful then of how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Present tense imperative. Who's responsible for that? Everybody put your hand up. I hope I'm not blocking you guys. I'm not blocking you. Okay. <clears throat> Making the most of every opportunity because the days are wonderful right now. How does, God, how does the Holy Spirit classify the days here on earth? Not my words. Not Eric's theology. That's the Holy Spirit saying that. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be drunk with the Spirit. No, that's not what it says. A lot of Pentecostals will say that, though. It doesn't say be drunk with the Spirit. It says be filled with the Spirit. That's actually the opposite of drunkenness. When you're filled with the Spirit, you are sober, you are aware, you are discerning, you know what's going on. Drunkenness is when you lose control. Right? It's the opposite. God didn't call us to roll around the floor and everything. He called you to a sober life. A sober life, I'm not just talking about not drinking. Nothing wrong with having a glass of wine. I'm talk he means being led by all that stuff, right? Speaking to one another, here's an example of being filled with the Spirit, right? He's going to tell you right here. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's filled with the Spirit. Very simple. But we add stuff from our narrative into the Word of God that warps it. 
that it? That's it. All right. Just a few examples there. So we're going to go ahead and have communion today. But just in closing, know that God has a plan for your life. We hear that all the time, but it's true. And if you haven't figured it out, you're still in your life, you're not for sure, you need to get alone with God and let Him speak to you, begin to study His Word, participate in your local body of Christ, right? And grow in the Lord. Amen? It's not a big mystery that it's a hard thing to figure out. He will guide you and direct you because He wants to show you. Amen? Amen? So be encouraged, church, but also at the same time, be reverent of God's word. Amen.